Hello, welcome to episode number 85 of CXO Talk. I am Michael Krigsman, and today we are talking about the world of enterprise venture capital investing. I'm here with my gloriously friendly co-host, Vala Offshore. Vala, Vala, how are you? Michael, thank you for the incredible introduction. Vala, because you are incredible. And we have an amazing guest today, Vala. We do, please. Introductions. We are joined today by Bruce Cleveland, who is a general partner with Interwest. And Bruce is really one of the, the top and most respected uh, software as a service investors in the world. Bruce, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Michael. And Vala. Excellent. Bruce, could you tell us uh, briefly a little bit about your professional background and Interwest? Sure. Um, I spent uh, probably 25, 26 years on the operating side, so actually the majority of my career was really in the creation of products with some really great companies. I uh, started out with at and the, in the data side, designing data networks, uh, went to work for this small little tiny startup of a few people with a pretty interesting idea called Oracle, uh, where I ran the Unix division and uh, got involved with some pretty great people. Um, many of them we all know, uh, Larry Ellison, uh, uh, Mark uh, Benioff, Tom Siebel, and I end up working for Tom later on uh, when he started Siebel Systems after I did a five or six year stint at Apple Computer running an engineering group there. Uh, I was a number of different things besides um, besides what I started off as. I did uh, VP of Marketing, I was end up becoming actually the we didn't call it that, a, a chief marketing officer, but I, I, I held that, that title. <laughs> I was the uh, VP of Business Dev and Alliances, and uh, I ended up being the uh, chief product officer for Siebel Systems for several years before we sold the company to Oracle, and that's when I joined. Um, I decided not to go back <laughs> to Oracle. It was a company of 100 some odd thousand people, and I uh, decided to try something different. So I joined here at Interwest, in uh, 2006, uh, focused on helping them to build a, a new practice uh, in the software industry using um, uh, software as a service as a business model. And um, Interwest itself is a firm that's been around for about 35 years. It's always been diversified. Um, that is, IT is a constant, but a, uh, another half that either initially did retail type investments, things like Chuck E. Cheese and Il Fernayo. Um, we no longer do those, although that would have been interesting to have frequent, you know, flyer points into those companies. Um, but we do healthcare today. So half the firm is focused on healthcare, half the firm is focused on information technology. Of course, I'm on the IT side of that. And we do a small slice of healthcare IT. Um, and we could probably talk about those as well. So um, been around 35 years. We're investing the last few deals in our current fund, which is a $650 million fund. And we will be raising, we are in the middle of raising Interwest 11, which will be a smaller fund with a smaller group of people, um, but still focused around healthcare and uh, IT. So that's who we are, and that's what we do, and uh, where I'm focused. So your, your title is general partner. Very briefly, just tell us for people who don't know, what does that mean? What is a general, what is a general partner at a major VC firm do? So there's um, different titles in different firms, and sometimes they carry um, meaningful and differentiated uh, roles. Um, generally, uh, the, the less experienced or perhaps younger folks are associates and principals. They typically don't have a checkbook. They tend to do networking, analysis, et cetera. Uh, then you could kind of move up the ladder in, as a, uh, a venture partner. Um, and a venture partner is not, um, and this is key, jointly and severally liable <laughs> for all the decisions of the firm. Um, that's an important thing to, uh, uh, to, 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 to note. So, um, but they many times do have a checkbook, and in this firm we do. Uh, that's actually how I joined Interwest as a venture partner uh, to see if I was a interested and b any good at the at, at this, 
eventually, um, uh, people become uh, general partners, and basically the distinction there is you help govern the firm. You are you are um, a partner in all uh, in all that means. It means that you're responsible for hiring, firing, uh, running the budgets. Um, and and basically being uh, responsible for the uh, the financials of the firm, in addition to writing checks into companies, and that's basically the big the big uh, differentiating factor between a general partner GP and a partner. So, from a broader perspective, our audience understands that you are driving uh, investment thesis and opportunities for IT and 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 software as a service. But you know, can you talk to us specifically about areas that you like to um, invest in, and and why? Yeah, um, and maybe it goes back to um, uh, doing what you know. Um, I I didn't enter this this practice uh, really understanding venture. Most of the companies I've been involved with weren't venture backed. Siebel Systems wasn't. You know, Apple may have been way long. You know, before I was there, uh, Oracle wasn't, etc. So I really wasn't that familiar with the venture model. And uh, I came in basically saying that um, I, I really need to learn this business model before I b before I try to venture off of things that I don't really know well. So I am um, um, my uh, my goal and where I focused in is is in the areas of technology that I was very familiar with. So B two B application software, B two B infrastructure, and B two B to C. Um, I don't really do consumer investing. I spent six seven years building products at Apple. And um, and my analysis of building and, and investing in that area is somewhat going to Las Vegas. And instead of the roulette wheel being a, a one of of a hundred spaces, it's ten thousand spaces, and you have to call the actual one space that it's going to land. The ball is going to land on. That's um, for me. That's fraught with lots of um, peril. So <laughs> I chose to stick with the areas that I think I could have a controlling factor over, which is identifying. Uh, business processes that are that are um, suboptimal in a company, applying information technology against those problems, and then um, building uh, and 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 helping companies to build um, those applications, finding people to help that, and uh, and and going after that. And it would be in two basic spaces. Um, they would be either category disruptive or category creating. Um, category. An example of category disruptive is what Workday's done, uh, where you've got um, uh, a team that well understood the the um, the back of the CRP elements, having built PeopleSoft, basically refabricating that in a new form factor and business model. An example of category creating is what a company like Marketo's really done, which is to take advantage. It was a, a sort of a a, a um, uh, a tested market, marketing automation, but not in the way that Marketo really thought about it. And so that was a company coming in to create a brand new category that uh, we had hoped that uh, at the time of our investment would become something significant. So those are the two things that I look for and we look for as a team, category creating, category disruptive, very, very large markets, billion dollar plus, and technology process process-oriented technology where we're sure that once it becomes adopted, very hard to uh, rip out of the fabric of a, of a company's business model. Now, you have a reputation as being one of the early uh, software-as-a-service investors. What were the characteristics of SaaS and that market back at, at, at that early stage that you identified as being uh, particularly compelling? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. So I perhaps I had an unfair competitive advantage back in 2005, 2006 in having had to, um, I had actually retired from Siebel Systems, went sailing for a couple of years, had the chance to kind of clean, you know, sort of my thoughts, rejoined Siebel and took over the, their, what they called uh, CRM on demand, which is their SaaS business, targeting primarily mid-market and, and, and Salesforce at the time. Um, and so my interest in software as a service really started with getting my teeth kicked in in that business model, having to learn that it's a, it's a, a different set of metrics, um, different issues that you need to be concerned with when you're running that practice and running that model, and then especially how challenging it was to make that successful inside of Siebel Systems. 
And perhaps maybe that was the biggest insight for me was recognizing up front that it was going it was like having a virus inside of, of, of a body and there were a lot of antibodies going on inside of that company. And in fact, I, I projected into any other incumbent company um, that it would have a very challenging time to overcome. I mean, I was one of the insiders. Uh, close with Tom, and even then, it was extraordinarily difficult to get that flywheel kind of moving inside the company. That's what led me to when I joined Interwest to suggest that I thought it would be very interesting to attack the incumbents uh, with that business model, uh, because it would be very hard for them to be responsive successfully. So that was the special insight I came. And the other part was you have to differentiate yourself in this, you know, venture capital is competitive like anything else. What I wanted to do is hang my shingle out and say, look, I'm one of the few people who've actually had to build and run a SaaS business. I understand the business model, the metrics, the issues that are associated with it. Maybe I could be of more assistance than one of my brethren up and down Sand Hill Road. And that was, that was the way that I entered uh, that model. So some of the companies that you invested in I brought into our company, uh, mm -hmm. such as Marketo for marketing automation and get satisfaction for our community. All of you know, both well integrated into our Salesforce CRM uh, solution. So when you think about companies like Marketo or GetSat, tell us your thinking and your process of selecting to partner with these companies. What did you see, for example, in Marketo, who was very early in this? in this you know, marketing automation space. Um, and of course, now they're, they're a leader in that space. Um, so great question. So th this is where um, you know, a lot of luck comes <laughs> into <laughs> the being successful. Um, I did happen to come in with a, a, a thesis when I joined here, which is more than just SaaS. Um, and that is that we were undergoing a complete um, overhaul of our entire product suite at Siebel. And it was pretty clear to me that Oracle was not going to take any of those ideas forward. They had a lot of their own initiatives, not the least of which is a big, giant project called Fusion. Um, and any of the ideas that we had on the drawing board that we had actually rolled out at Siebel Customer World in October of 2005, it became pretty clear to me with my conversations with a variety of executives there, they were less than interested in, in those concepts and more interested in just taking the asset of Siebel and, and continuing to monetize it. So we certainly turned over all those plans, which was the, professionally and, uh, the professional and ethical thing to do. Um, but I brought those actually over here to Interwest with my thought partner over here, uh, Doug um, uh, Pepper, who co-leads the IT practice for us here. We sat down in front of a whiteboard, and what I drew out for him and what he augmented was this notion of completely transforming enterprise applications in the front office starting with into uh, data-driven or analytical applications that would enable companies to, um, to make better decisions at the moment of value, to convert subjective data into objective data, um, for example. And to uh, pr that is to take what used to be transaction purely transactional systems, but to infuse them with analytics, so I can make a better business decision. And we wanted to take a position across the entire revenue supply chain. That was our term for um, the conversion of revenue, which you could define down into discrete clicks on a website, and apply uh, resources against those um, over time as they became more valuable move them through the revenue supply chain, applying more and more value to it and converting that into ultimately um, so a complete whole product revenue. That was the concept. We called this uh, revenue performance management and we, um, or, or RPM. And it was actually the subject of the keynote that I gave in, in October of 2005. Um, we labeled it RPM uh, and we said the first thing we want to pick off is we're going to pick off marketing. Um, why? Well, because it was well underserved. Um, at the time, uh, Google had already taught us that if you wanted to sell a product or service as a company, you needed to get people to search for that. And if we could combine those two things together, mm -hmm. put a vendor in front of a buyer as fast as possible, people, vendors would pay for that and buyers would, uh, would value it. 
So the concept was for the first time we could actually do digital marketing. We could actually understand when, when somebody, a prospect, uh, might be interested in a product or service that we were selling. And that notion, coupled with the fact that I had been the chief, we didn't call it chief marketing officer, I was the head of marketing at Siebel, I, uh, what that told me was um, if we could convert the chief marketing officer from uh, an expense center to a revenue center where we could, instead of a party planner, event management, etc., we could do what Tom Siebel actually demanded I do, which is to take a bunch of Wharton quant jocks, run a bunch of models, and accurately predict not in period revenue, but next period and the period thereafter. If we could do that, if we could make the chief marketing officer have an equal seat at the executive table where every chief executive would look at, at their chief sales officer and ask for the, the, the call the ball on in period revenue and then look to the chief marketing officer and says, I want to know what we're going to do next quarter because I have to guide Wall Street. If we could do that, this would be a billion dollar idea. Um, and so I have to thank Tom for kicking my teeth in <laughs> for, so, for so long to give us that kind of insight. We met with all the existing companies. Uh, we met with Eloqua. We met with Silverpop, VTrends. Uh, I met with, four, and Doug and I met with um, the former, you know, marketing automation companies, uh, Anuncio, Market First, um, failed CEOs in that category. And at the end of it, what we we concluded, and this is where the luck part comes in, I think. And they'll have to they'll have to confirm this, but I think the the execs at, at Marketo would say would confirm this, the founders, um, that they were about two weeks away from disbanding. They had met with everybody. Oh, on <laughs> Hill. Everybody thought this was a terrible idea. You fire marketing people first; they're of no value. It block. <laughs> so, I think that they they walked into into Interwest thinking they were you know the final buzzsaw, and instead we had one of those magical mind melds where. We didn't know what products they were going to build, but we knew that if they wanted to go on the journey of transforming the chief marketing officer into this new revenue generating function, we were up for that. So we had to carry them through there. There was no product, no code. There wasn't a dog, but everything else that you would hear about sort of the iconic Silicon Valley, it's, it's definitely that story of a startup. Um, so we invested the first round, second round, third round. Couldn't get anybody interested. As a result, we probably owned an unfair share of the company. Um, but eventually um, dragged some other firms kicking and screaming into, into the company, some very good firms, and uh, they were very helpful. And uh, the company did all the, the rest. They did it all. So we're, um, that was our first stake in the ground on revenue performance management. And now we've built an entire portfolio, uh, Optimizely, Spreadfast, Get Satisfaction, Aria Systems, NewsCred. I mean, if you look at Doug and my portfolio individually on the website, you'll just see a bunch of logos. If you line those up against advertising, marketing, sales, service, and support, and you put the logos under those categories and tie revenue performance management over the top, you see a much different, you see the strategy emerge. So, so we want to come back. Let's come back to uh, to uh, CRM and its descendants and where it's going. But we have a question from Twitter, and we like to defer to the audience. And so we have a question from Frank Scavo, who's one of the top enterprise software analysts out there. And he asked, he asked what I was thinking when you spoke earlier about the difficulty of on-premise software companies to adopt the metrics and the mindset and the different technologies. So what does that mean for companies like incumbents like SAP and Oracle today who are both trying to and have ex explicitly stated that basically they're the cloud companies? Yeah. Well, I, I think that there's words and there are um, actions. And I think if you talk to some of the people who've attempted to build those uh, inside, and those are incredibly challenging projects. So um, my hat's off to the people who have attempted to do that internally. Um, you're fighting a systemic endemic issue, which is that the entire business model is built on an entirely different set of metrics. Um, 
you know, when you, you don't get to just build a product, you actually have to be the IT group for the product. There's different margins involved. There's different, there's different, um, a different vernacular used in the, the exec meeting at Salesforce from the exec meeting at SAP. Hmm. In addition, you have the, this other problem, which is that the, the revenue contribution of those product lines initially are so infant. I mean, they're rounding errors compared to the other business. You're fighting for resources inside these companies to, against revenue lines that are going to help or make or break a quarter. It's always been my, uh, my observation that as much as the internal, as these incumbent teams, they're very smart people. Um, you know, uh, Bill McDermott at SAP, he was a peer of mine at Siebel when I, uh, and so he's a very sharp guy now running uh, SAP. Um, he's got a huge issue. He has to s satisfy shareholders, but he also then has to transform this company so it can operate on a different cadence and business model. That is really, really hard to do. I'm not sure you can survive as the executive team that through that process. Um, it's almost like you have to go private and then come back out to be public in order to be able to do it. Very few companies have done it. I think Concur did this. But other companies have had a very challenging time. And I just look at the people who've gone in to do it. They're, you know, Guys like Lars Dahlgaard, who went into SAP and is now over at Andreessen. Um, I, I just think this is really, really tough stuff to do. The company that might be able to do it, though, the one that I have kind of my money on is Oracle. And the reason is, is that I think if you ask Larry, they really are a subscription business. Their business today, maintenance and support, if you want to know why Safra and, and, um, and uh, Mark Hurd don't discount on maintenance, it's because that's the lifeblood of that company. Take a look at the contribution that that revenue provides. They might be able to make it over the hurdle and, comp and transform the engine underneath to be able to be a, a, a much more of a subscription model. Others though I think this is going to be really really hard and uh, it might go through the valley of death to come back out the other side and I'm not sure how many people, again I don't know whether the the executive team of a company currently in place operating under those business models, an on-prem model could really make it through that transformation. Can you, can you put a time frame? What's the, what's the time frame, the life cycle of going through that valley of death, or at least the valley of huge pain, and being able to emerge. What's yeah? I, I, I mean, I would say it's it's five to ten years. I mean, I, you're going to have to overhaul the entire company, and and that just seems. I mean, I just haven't seen it. Maybe you guys have. Um, I, I've seen again. We've all we've listened. We've listened to IBM. We've listened to SAP. We listened to these companies talk about how they 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 intend to be, be the the cloud company. Intending, wanting, desiring is a lot different than actually putting in place the, the mechanics to sure. really make that work. Is this uh, the Clay Christensen innovators dilemma scenario, or more than that? I think that's it in spades. Yeah. 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 So you had early focus on CRM, and, and I think the audience would want to be in, uh, is interested in knowing why, and perhaps your views of where where is CR, CRM evolving to. Somebody asked me just recently, you know, who's going to be a big player in CRM that's not the usual suspect? And I thought about it, and I, you know, first company that popped in my mind I thought was LinkedIn. I just mm -hmm. thought, you know, strong database, social integrated into the you know, into the fabric of it, which I think social is absolutely the future in enterprise. So I don't know, that's a company that kind of popped in my head. Uh, but I would love to know, you know, where is CRM evolving and why did you have such a strong interest in CRM early on? So obviously because of being with Siebel, which I, we didn't coin the term CRM, by the way. I think it was um, Mary Coleman who was CEO over at Aram and, and is now doing venture investing. I believe she's the one that should be credited with that term. But we certainly tried to conscript it at, at, uh, at Siebel. I think Tom's view is rather ma Machiavellian. You know, you, I don't think you, you, you manage your customers like that. But anyway, um, so CRM has become obviously a, a well-accepted term. Um, I, I believe that that essentially though is just the this this a contact database in spades. Um, you know, really, what these are is the ability to capture a name, an address, an opportunity. 
that is, uh, <clears throat> I think initially that's required to be able to do what actually Tom had thought about doing many years ago. Um, but in fact, I think is is an opportunity to be transformed. Um, I don't know whether Salesforce will do it or, or not, but I can give you my my sort of two cents on what I think um, where we might go with this. M my feeling, and I actually have a bet here, so uh, you know maybe I have a, a, a I have a dog in this hunt, and I'll tell you about what I think about it. I actually think there's a guy. Um, named uh, Don Peppers and a gal, Martha Rogers, that wrote a book uh, many years ago, and one-to-one uh, -one marketing. It was uh, combined with a guy named Joe Pine who wrote a book called Mass Customization. And the idea about being able to connect the right person at the right point at the right time with the right product at the right price, right? And that was a very broad and very interesting vision. Um, my view is that, you know, a lot of... Uh, um, sedimentary layers in technology had to be laid in place before that could begin to materialize. But I think we're beginning to reach that point. We're able to, we have a lot of new technology that's emerged that has allowed us to be able to capture people's interest um, uh, at the, at, in real time. Uh, and we're beginning through the, you know, these, uh, these devices to be able to reach people in real time. They're with us all the time. So my view is that the next the next phase, CRM 3.0, is really about, it's, it's a lot less about the, the capturing of a name and address, but it's about, as you suggested, applying the demographics of a person who we know something about and being able to, to reach them in real time to provide them with an offer or service that's relevant to something that they want. Um, so a bet that we recently made is on a team that actually built all of Siebel's loyalty products. And you may not know this, but those products power a lot of the most powerful loyalty programs in the world today, like Starbucks. Um, we took that team and we're building a new company that can, in real time, provide uh, offers that are relevant, that pull from social media, pull from enterprise data, and can provide an offer in real time for, uh, for companies of all sizes. Uh, we're in the very early innings of this. It's a very great team. Um, I like to bet on great teams, just like you might bet on Dave Duffield and Anils Boozrid being successful with Workday. It wasn't hard to imagine. We <laughs> tried to replicate that. And, but I think that's an example of, of, the, of building off of things like Mark Benioff has done with Salesforce, what we did at Siebel, and using some of this next generation technology like Hadoop and others to be able to give us the ability to um, to uh, materialize the vision that, that folks like uh, Don Roger, like uh, Don Peppers and Martha Rogers, uh, folks like Tom Siebel, originally had with uh, with the CRM industry. Is there enough predictive analytics in CRM to even beat real time? In other words, you understand the buying behavior and the pattern and the buyer's journey based on various personas. You've gone through the market segmentation, account segmentation, buyer segmentation, and now you have the ability, again, to connect to the market segment of one with that smart mobile user, and you can offer things to him and her uh, using predictive analytics and really delight the customer in advance of need uh, or perceived need. If, if that, I, I don't know if that, I'm clear in terms of the question, but how much will di big data and uh, predictive analytics drive this CRM version 3.0 that you that you define? Um, that's a great question. So, as you might imagine, I might have a uh, a dog in the hunt on this one too. <laughs> um, so that that's great. The the issue really is around data in. You know, the most important part is that you have to have a tremendous amount of data. Uh, and it needs to be available in real time. It needs to be fine-grained in order to be able to, to make the offer relevant. Otherwise, it's just damn annoying. Um, and so the, um, the, the first problem to solve in this predictive science um, area is to make sure that you really are capturing fine-grained, detailed data in real time and then being able to then provide a set of analytic services that the predictive science runs against so it has many more data points to, to run its algorithms against to then generate a better or a more uh, a more um, uh, effective uh, prediction. Sure. 
So uh, we actually started seven years ago building a platform to do this. It took, you know, I, I, my partners probably <laughs> aren't too happy with me how much it costs to build this, but we've, we've actually built one to try to, to go after uh, revenue prediction and rolled it, started rolling out last year. It's a company called C9. And what they do is they, they are used by Google, Yahoo, Pandora, Splunk, LinkedIn, a whole bunch of companies we've all heard about. Um, they basically at the beginning of the quarter uh, run all the reps and opportunities. They process about $2 trillion of revenue and about $60 billion um, transactions. And they um, build models off of those to predict down to the deal level and down to the rep level what's going to close in that quarter. And after two or three sales cycles of running through, and it's a great data science team out of Oxford and Cambridge, you know, very smart people that I could never have gotten into those schools with. Um, the, uh, they run these models, and then they, they're visualized through the, the UI, through mobile and web. And um, they give those, um, the sales organizations and the finance organizations these predictions. And after two or three sales cycles, they're getting anywhere from 83 to 92% accurate. Wow. That, as you can imagine, is pretty transformational. Um, and I think we're just at the cutting edge of this. You know, I think that using the tra they, they ingest the transactional data out of Salesforce and now out of Marketo. Right. Other, and, they're, and then they append that with social and then to generate these predictions. So I think we're going to see a bunch of companies emerge, and we already have companies like, I think, Profiri and Infer and others that are attempting to do similar things with these next generation architectures. So they're not building, they're not replicating CRM as we know it. They're not replicating the transactional systems. Those are all in right. place. They're generating systems of engagement, the ones that sit on the systems of records, to use and process that data to actually deliver what 20 years ago we had initially hoped uh, and predicted that we could. So at that point, the value of CRM actually accrues to the users of that system rather than just to the managers who now have basically greater ability to oversee their sales force in effect. Absolutely, and I think that's the problem. CRM was built for the company, right? It, it really is a, it's a transactional system that the company uses to beat the crap out of its sales organization. <laughs> so if you're smart as a sales rep, you don't enter that million-dollar deal until it's like down to signing the damn order. I mean, otherwise, you've got the CEO of the company, you know, um, <laughs> effectively on your butt the entire quarter. So... Um, I think that uh, what's happening now is that these new systems, what they do is they deliver something to the rep. They tell you, hey, guess what? Out of your portfolio of opportunities, these five deals are your most likely candidates. Yeah. And the reason is they have a pattern that matches others in the company. You might want to focus there. They can also identify reps that, that maybe they're really good at prospecting but not great at closing. So what you can do with this type of a product like what C9 does is they show the manager and the rep what deals they might want to work on together. And the manager can help the rep in areas where he or she might not be as good. Um, and so that's the power. This is no longer, you know, it's no longer the, the uh, stick. It's the carrot. And then there's kind of the interesting part, which I like, which is that there's kind of a leaderboard analysis that shows kind of where you are in your forecasting predictions and holds you personally accountable for them for, for perpetuity. So <laughs> that probably makes your CRM data more reliable, yeah. um, which is one of the big issues. DQ, data quality, has always been a big problem in CRM systems. So it has a naturally self-cleaning you know, and... Um, um, a process. So that's why I like it, and that's why I think um, I think we'll, we're going to see more of this emerge. That makes sense. Well, that makes sense. let's. Uh, you know, we we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left, so let's jump topics. We could actually continue on this I topic totally for another for another five hours. I was going to say I was going to say two hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because <laughs> but, what you just said uh, before we jump. I mean, I always think about the marketing automation on the front end of the customer acquisition funnel. Mm -hmm and how we score leads and marketing qualified gets into sales qualified and all that. You get to that opportunity stage and there's a lot of opportunity for automating and scoring the opportunity based on the buyer signal 
and all the social activity and everything that's taking place with the rep and the partner and the customer. And now the technology has finally caught up to well, the, enable that. But all that automation is at the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. I don't see the same level of sophistication, reporting, predictive analytics, regression analysis on all of that once the opportunity is created in CRM. And if you can take that intelligence all the way to the end, even post you know, winning the customer and use that for advocacy and loyalty, that's where the magic should be. Anyway, we can, we'll shift to another, but this topic is so juicy. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, Michael. Sorry. Up. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to be a shill for C9. That's not, that's not the, that's not the purpose of this. But I think that that's exactly what they have a product called OpScore, and that's exactly what they're, they're doing. They're using machine learning to do that. At Marketo, if you wanted to run a campaign, etc., you, you had to sort of decide what the scoring was. Right. What's more important is, and you might have a point of view on what's causal versus what's correlative. Right. I think it's far more important for machine learning to tell us what's causal. And, uh, and it can do it much more rapidly and I think much more uh, uh, objectively and quantifiably. So anyway, en enough on that one, but, but I absolutely agree with you. I'm going to check C9 for sure. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah and there's, I mean, there are a bunch of companies who are taking stabs at pieces of this and it seems like this is going to be the next, over the next year, this will be the next big battleground. Yeah, We think so. Uh, so so let's let's shift gears for for right now. Well, and hopefully you'll come back another time and we can continue uh, the discussion of companies and trends. But uh, corporate innovation. How do you see corporate VCs who have now started to enter your turf as uh, and enter the startup ecosystem? Yeah, corporate innovation is kind of an oxymoron, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, and I know it's really popular to be a ch you know, chief innovation officer, and these things sound really great in the annual reports. But the truth is, you know, once we get to be a company of, of a certain size and magnitude, everything in that company exists to preserve status quo. You actually, it's anathema to have innovation. Innovation means you disrupt everything. It's, it's, in, it's unstable, non-predictive. Um, we're not rewarded on Wall Street for unpredictable <laughs> things, you know. So, and you learn to keep your job, uh, it's about preserving status quo. And that's why you end up having a challenging time doing in-house innovation. Um, Off-balance sheet innovation, which is effectively what corporate development is about, is about you know, making sure that you don't put something really cool that could actually cannibalize a revenue stream inside the company because the antibodies will emerge to destroy that. And I think we've all read numerous HBS cases on on this concept. So I think that um, uh, the truth is for me, I, and I've tried this, I, I, I wrote a blog about um, spin-ins and taking kind of a page out of what Cisco has done uh, but maybe you know making it a business spin-in not a technical spin-in. And the reason I suggested this is that we waste a lot of money here on Sand Hill um, trying things out. Um, wouldn't it be a lot better if we took a look at kind of the, the, the blank white spaces that are going on inside these large enterprises and, and co partnering within, with those groups to build technologies that could be brought into the company that fit the architectural um, spec of that organization? Mm. Um, what, do, you know, what do small startups lack? Distribution, really, really, you know, and, and credibility. Um, what do large companies lack? Speed you know, um, iteration, uh, the ability to operate without legal hammering the, <laughs> you know, the hell out of you to try to get something out the door. Um, so I think if we did that, much like what pharma's learned to do, you know, pharma does a lot of off-balance sheet R&D. They have a really nice way of working with startups and then spinning those in to, uh, you know, to refill their pipeline. We don't do a good job of that here, and I've tried pitching this to a number of executives and companies, and the basic issue inside large uh, technology companies is a big NIH problem, not a minute here. Um, gee, you know, we're smarter, we could do it better, we can do it faster, and I would just argue that the, that the truth is the data shows that's not actually true, and we can see that most of the innovation is happening through acquisition uh, for these companies. The problem is, is that you know, that's kind of like throwing your net into the river and hoping that a fish that meets your spec is going to land in it. Um, I would rather, you know, you know, basically breed the dang fish. You know? So that way, um, when, it, when it matures, 
it uh, and I get first shot at bringing it in, you know, into uh, into the company. So um, that's kind of my my monologue on 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 innovation. I think that it's the right thing for Corp Dev to do, um, but I think they're getting involved too late. They want to see companies already working. They want you know they want all the risk to be borne by the venture groups, etc. And then they want to pick off the ones that they think could work. You know, um, for one thing, we're not building things that fit their business model necessarily. In fact, I would argue everything I'm doing is to build companies that destroy business models of incumbents. So that makes it, um, and I'm not any different than in the other venture guys. So that puts us immediately at odds. The second part is, I'm guessing, you know, when I, when I was running products for Siebel, I knew exactly what we were going to build and why, um, but none of the venture guys did. And so they would, you know, they would parade their companies in front of us, hoping that we would buy one of them. And most times, they go, oh, that doesn't work. You're on a .NET architecture. We're Java, whatever. Well, why not architect the product um, up front that we know is going to be well suited for the product line, be able to build a product for half the cost or maybe a third of the cost that it would take inside the large company, do it twice as fast, and then when it emerges. Um, run it through the distribution channel to companies so the revenues rapidly increase. So when you fold it in, it's already going to be a significant contributor to that company. It makes all the sense in the world, but I think the organizational behavior issues of large companies versus small companies is a large impedance problem in that concept. Wow, we have uh, four minutes left. Bruce is dropping some mad science. I on know us. exactly. I know we could just go on here for hours, but uh, so I think we we can't leave you without asking your advice for startups. Yeah. Please give some sage advice. I'm a founder, CEO, startup. What give me give us some advice on how I can one be able to connect with amazing uh, business entrepreneurs like yourself and. What, you know, is it the team? Is it the product? Is it the pitch? Is it all of that? How do we reach you? And what are you going to? What's your criteria for deciding to fund us as opposed to somebody else? Okay, so one. I mean, I've learned a few things doing this. This uh, this sort of venture run, uh, and there's some I think universal truths here. I think this is a business of outliers. Um, it's about finding those outliers, investing in them. Those are the ones that make the returns that make limited partners interested in investing in venture. It's highly risky, as we've seen for the last 10 years or so until recently. On the IT side, for sure, it's been, um, it's been challenging for many, many firms, except for maybe the, the, the very best of, of, of brands. And the reason that the very best is because they see all the very best deals up front. So there is a, um, a have and have not element to that piece of it. And uh, they've been very good, um, you know, the Sequoias, the, the Benchmarks, um, Excels, et cetera. We know who they, who they all are. And then more recently with uh, Andreessen, which is an entirely different, business, a different uh, model. But the way that you, I mean, first and foremost is that our job is basically, I consider it to be a recruiting job. Our job is to find the best talent. So it really does start with um, um, two elements, the best talent and the best markets. If you have, it could be the best team in the world, but if it's a really small market, there's nothing you're going to do to make that an outlier, a, a, a billion, multi-billion dollar um, uh, result. So um, it has to be a large market. It needs to be addressable. So um, uh, legal profession, physicians, those are large markets really hard to go after. So it needs to be large, multi-multi-billion, and it needs to be addressable. So I need to be able to find the people who are going to make the decisions. That's the first thing. Without that, you might as well, it's a non-starter for any at least of the, the larger venture firms. Maybe if you're really small, maybe you're angel, it's a different story. But for our type of a firm, the, the larger ones that we all know, that's the first thing. The second part is team. Is it a 1% team? That means of all the teams that could possibly prosecute this, is this you know an A plus engineering, A plus marketing, A plus sales? Every seat needs to be an A caliber person. Um, without that team, uh, pretty hard to prosecute that market. So, and it's a team sport. So it's not just one individual. It's it's a collective of people who all have in every category, in every seat is, is an A talent. And, la and it's kind of funny, last 
um, is technology. Uh, unless it's a science experiment slash, you know, sort of time machine, more often than not, we can build these things. And so it may take a little longer. Uh, it may take a little more money, but typically uh, we, can build, we can build it. So um, my, my personal experience is that you first look for these large outlier markets and then recognize as an entrepreneur, we only have maybe two, um, but typically one. So don't get disappointed that we don't invest in yours because we might have just done one deal. So a lot of entrepreneurs walk in here and unlike, a, I mean, you're asking for millions of dollars. You'd be surprised. I've had people walk in and say, so there's this, there's this industry called CRM. Have you heard about that? And I and I and I did, I looked dumbfounded across the table. I said, "You're asking for ten million dollars, and you're sitting across from somebody who was part of that. Why wouldn't you know that? I wouldn't go to a sales call and say on you know Merrill Lynch or whoever without knowing precisely who's in that room, what their you know what they've done, what their possible you know what their opinion is going to be on this. I, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that just show up like this is some kind of ad hoc sales call and then wonder why it is that we don't, we're not very responsive to what they have to say. So at least sit, come in the room, know who you're talking to, find out if they've done a deal recently. If they have, they may not be uh, a viable opportunity for you because they're probably not, they're probably just gathering G2 on, you know, kind of the, the industry. So I would just suggest to entrepreneurs just do a little bit more due diligence, you know, um, on on who you're meeting with, and then cover off those three pieces for them, and I think you'll get a higher conversion rate. And can I just ask you one last very, very fast question on this? Just without thinking. Without thinking. <laughs> without no, thinking. do a lot of that. <laughs> Gut reaction. This is, you know. This yeah. is what I can tell with this. Speed round. Speed, speed, speed round, round yeah. yes. But this, but this is only one quick question. So just <laughs> gut reaction. What grabs, somebody walks in the door, what as an investor, uh, an entrepreneur walks in the door, what grabs your attention more than anything else, just off the cuff? Um, uh, their personal intellect combined with the, um, if it's an existing company, growth rate. So those two things initially. So ability to articulate what they do, in a very interesting way, very quickly, and then if they have a, uh, you know, if they have an existing product, growth rate. Those two things combined together certainly make the conversation um, a lot more interesting. All right, boy, I sure hope that there are a lot of entrepreneurs who hear this. It's great advice. So you have been watching episode number 85 of CXO Talk. And Was that the fastest 50 minutes? I know. Had? I wish we had. Bruce, you're awesome. Yeah, wow. thank you. I wish we had a lot more time. <laughs> so, and we've been we've been talking with Bruce Cleveland, who's general partner at Interwest and a one of the, the most experienced and long lasting software as a service investors. Bruce, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. You bet, and thank you for the opportunity. And I hope you'll come back another time. Absolutely. So. Vala, as always. Michael, great show. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, I hope you will come back next time. We will be here and hope you'll be here with us. Bye-bye. <laughs>